Tibet, an ancient, harsh, and mysterious land. Its history is not often mentioned or discussed, especially in the West. However, this land was once the seat of a great empire that conquered many foes, dominated the Silk Road trade routes, and became a great power in the Central Asian region. Welcome to my channel, Unknown History. In this video we will learn the history of this great Tibetan Empire, starting with its rise to prominence and ending with its fall from grace. To understand the Tibetan Empire, we first need to understand the geography of the region known as Tibet. Tibet is bounded in the north and east by the central Chinese plains, and to the west by the Kashmir region of modern day India and Pakistan, and to the south by the Great Himalayan mountain range. The defining geological structure of the Tibetan region is the Tibetan Plateau, often referred to as the roof of the world, and this is for good reason. The massive region contains the world's two highest summits in Mount Everest and K2 and has an average elevation of 4,500 meters or 14,800 feet. For comparison, the tallest mountain in the Swiss Alps, Monte Rosa, is 4,634 meters or 15,203 feet tall. The plateau is also known for its many glaciers and massive glacial lakes that feed the major river systems of the Ganges Delta as well as the river systems of the Chinese plains such as the Swalween, Mekong, and Yangtze's. The Tibetan region can be broken up into two distinct regions, the lake region and the river region. The lake region is in the west and northwest and is characterized by rolling hills and massive glacial lakes. The lake region's climate is harsh and not suited for agriculture while the river region with its large valleys has a more subtropical to temperate climate that is more suitable for agriculture and as a result permanent and large human settlements. Archaeological data suggests modern humans started inhabiting the Tibetan Plateau about 21,000 years ago. Megalithic monuments dot the Tibetan Plateau and may have been used in ancestral worship. Iron Age hill forts and burial complexes have been found. However, the remoteness and harsh climate make archaeological work difficult in the region. It is important to understand that until the foundation of the Tibetan Empire, the Tibetan people had no system of writing, and as a result, the only information that can be found is either through oral histories or from Chinese scholars. They were typically quite biased and often painted other people groups as barbarians. It is commonly agreed upon by scholars that the whole Tibetan region before the rise of the Tibetan Empire was splintered between many local chieftains and warlords. The Shangshong Kingdom in western Tibet seems to have been the only fairly united kingdom in the region at this time, and is the likely origin of the eastern religion known as Bon that is still lightly practiced today. These early Tibetan people were most likely nomadic and culturally very similar to the Proto-Mongolic and Turkic peoples that dominated the Eurasian steppe. It is assumed that they also likely constantly fought with one another and may have taken to raiding the settled people on their borders. A Chinese source from 108 AD mentions an attack from Tibetans on Chinese posts along the Silk Road that was repelled at the price of fierce fighting. Similar incursions were reportedly repelled in 168 AD by a Chinese general Guang Gong. These raids were being staged by powerful clans in the Yarlung River Valley region in the river region of Tibet. And this is where the story of the Tibetan Empire begins. Almost 500 years later, a man by the name of Namri Songson was the leader of a clan that managed to subdue and prevail over all of their neighbors in the Yarlung River Valley region. Around the year 608, Namri sent two ambassadors to the Chinese Wei dynasty and announced the formation of his state to the Chinese emperor of the Sui. This marks the first recorded appearance of a united Tibetan state on the international scene. This newborn regional state, led by Namri's son, would eventually become the Tibetan Empire. In the year 618 AD, Namri Songson was assassinated by suspected poisoning from an unknown perpetrator. This led to Namri's son, Songson Gampo, to become the first Simpo of Tibet. The traditional title of Tibetan emperors, meaning firm and all-powerful. The taking of this title shows the goals that this founder of the empire had when he took the throne. Following his father's death, a brief rebellion rose up, likely led by the faction responsible for his father's assassination. Songs and Gampo swiftly put down the rebellion and likely had the conspirators executed, as throughout his reign he would deal with any possible dissent very harshly, likely wanting to avoid the fate that had befallen his father. Songson, however, was not bloodthirsty and proved to be a talented diplomat early on in his rule. In 627 AD, he sent his chief minister, Maijan Manjpo, to make peace with the Sampo people of North Tibet and bring them under the banner of his new empire. 
Despite Minister Myong's success with the Sampo, only five years later, in 632 AD, he was executed by Songsen for suspected treason. Songsen then appointed his longtime ally and friend Gar Songsen to replace him. Songsen Gampo viewed that Tibet and himself were destined for greatness, and he would not sit idly by until that vision was fulfilled. He now had his sights set on the ancient kingdom of Shangshong in West Tibet. According to Tang China's records, Songsen Gampo in 634 AD marched into western Tibet with a great army where the king of Shangshong submitted to him along with many other tribes in the region, deciding it was better to join this growing empire peacefully than to be subjugated forcefully. With the annexation of Shangshong, Songsen Gampo had control of effectively the entire Tibetan plateau. Later in that same year, with this newfound power and new heightened sense of place in the world, Songsen Gampo sent his minister, Gar Songsen, to the court of legendary Tang Emperor Tai Song, demanding a marriage to a Chinese princess, a right only reserved for the all-powerful and for whom the Tang Emperor saw as equals. Tai Song, viewing the Tibetan people as mountain barbarians and having heard slanders from a Tu Yuhan diplomat, a rival people that controlled trade along the Silk Road, rejected the request. Insulted by the emperor's dismissal, in response, Songsen Gampo in 637 AD, with a force of likely around 100,000 men, went beyond the Tibetan plateau and invaded the Tuyuhan people in the north, along with several smaller tribes, and subjugated them. These lands held many important Silk Road trade routes, and the Tibetan emperor was now threatening the Chinese border region of Songchao with his massive and experienced army. At this time, I believe it is important to describe the Tibetan Empire's armies. The Tibetan Empire's armies, according to many sources, were primarily made up of cavalry. These were not professional soldiers and were likely called upon on an ad hoc basis. However, like other nomadic peoples, these horsemen had often spent years on horseback either hunting or herding in the hills of the Tibetan Plateau. This made them exceptionally talented and tough soldiers. They also likely borrowed other martial aspects from nomadic peoples, such as often having both their horses and themselves in full chainmail armor during battle. Tibetan soldiers were also renowned swordsmen and lancers. The Tibetans also had a good understanding of siege equipment, likely due to the fact that their homeland had many mountain forts which they had learned to effectively siege for centuries in their conflicts with one another. According to Du Yu, a Chinese historian, Tibetans fought in this manner. The men and the horses all wear chainmail armor. Its craftsmanship is extremely fine. It envelops them completely, leaving only openings for the two eyes. Thus, strong bows and sharp swords cannot injure them. When they do battle, they dismount and array themselves in ranks. When one man dies, another takes his place. To the end, they are not willing to retreat. Their lances are longer and thinner than those in China. Their archery is weak, but their armor is strong. The men always use swords. Even when they are not at war, they still go about carrying swords. After several successful campaigns in 638 AD in the north of China, Songsen Gampo then led his army further into Chinese territory and sacked the frontier city of Songshao. However, the Chinese quickly counterattacked, and due to the fact that they didn't want to face the renowned Tibetan horse warriors in a pitched battle, opted to attack them in a surprise nighttime raid outside the sacked city. Due to the surprising nature of the attack, the Tang army was able to score a major victory against the Tibetans and Songsen Gampo ordered a withdrawal from China back to Tibet. It is said after this campaign in 639 AD that Songsen Gampo's younger brother got into a dispute with him, and Songsen, believing that his brother was plotting a coup, had his younger brother burned alive. The following year, in 640 AD, Songsen Gampo again sent his minister Gar Songsen to the emperor Taizong's court. He apologized by sending the emperor gifts of silk and gold. Emperor Taizong this time agreed to the young Senpo's request and sent his niece, Princess Wencheng, to become his bride. Arriving a year later in 641 AD, this is a significant day as Princess Wencheng happened to be a devout Buddhist and is the first recorded instance of Buddhism coming to Tibet. It is also likely at the time that Songsen Gampo may have received another Buddhist bride of Nepalese origins named Birakuti. However, the historical records of the time make it hard to confirm her existence outside of legends. Sung Sun Gampo, with his newfound prestige from his foreign brides and the wealth from his conquests, now looked inward to develop his young empire. Now in good relations with the Chinese, envoys brought back the paper and astrological technologies of China to Tibet. At this time, Sung Sun Gampo also instituted a Tibetan system of writing that borrowed from both Indian systems of writing as well as Chinese 
which he then, according to legend, studied for three years until he was literate. Using this new written language, Song Tsongkhapa would then write a code of unified laws for the Tibetan Empire's people and start the official archiving and keeping of records at his court. The administration of the empire would also be developed at this time, breaking it into four distinct horns, which were each then administered by local chieftains in the region. Songsen also moved the capital of the empire from the Yarlung River Valley to the more centrally located Kichu Valley, where he then founded the capital city of Lhasa, a city which would remain the capital of the empire until it fell and still stands to this day. It is also believed that sometime between the years 641 AD and 649 AD, Songsen Gampo converted to Buddhism, likely due to influence from his foreign brides and foreign rulers alike. Songsen Gampo is credited as the first of three Dharma kings in Tibet and was significant in the founding of Tibetan Buddhism, an evolved form of Mahayana Buddhism that still preserves many tantric practices from India while also incorporating many Himalayan and Tibetan religious traditions as well. He also commissioned the first establishment of a Buddhist temple in Tibet, the Jokhan Temple in Lhasa, as well as many other famous temples in the region such as the Traduk Temple in Nidong. The first Simpo, Songsen Gampo, had inherited a small state in the south of Tibet, and in his youth had expanded its borders to dominate the entire plateau and even parts of the Silk Road states. As he aged, he consolidated his new empire's borders and instituted the necessary reforms to modernize it and ensure its success. With that as his legacy, the first Simpo of the Tibetan Empire, Songsen Gampo, died near 650 AD. Upon hearing of the great leader's death, Tang China acted swiftly and invaded the Tibetan Empire and occupied their capital at Lhasa, hoping to destroy the upstart empire. However, the Tibetan court had heard of the approaching threat and simply retreated deep into the mountains. The Chinese generals leading the invasion realized that they could not winter their armies in such a hostile and unknown land like the Tibetan Plateau without any proper support and quickly returned to China, with nothing to show for their invasion. After Song Tsung Gampo's death, the heir to the empire was his grandson, Mansong Monson. However, he was too young to rule at the time. This meant that true power was laid in the hands of Songsen Gampo's longtime friend and minister, Gar Songsen. Gar Songsen ruled his region of the Tibetan Empire from 650 AD to 667 AD. At that time, Gar expanded the empire into the Kashmir region of India, conquering more small Silk Road states as well, and fully incorporated the two Yuhan conquests of Songsen Gampo into the Tibetan Empire. Gar Songsen also focused on issuing taxes on Silk Road trade and a census on all of the empire's lands to more effectively tax and draw soldiers from the now vast empire. Gar understood that for the Tibetan Empire to sustain its progress, it would need money and to raise armies from its newly conquered lands. Fortunately for the Tibetan Empire, its neighbors were like them, semi-nomadic warriors that made excellent soldiers. The Tibetan Empire continued to harass Tang China's western borders at this time. The Tibetans celebrated the fact that their soldiers were clearly the superior fighters, despite often being heavily outnumbered by the Tang Chinese. The Tang armies of mostly untrained peasants stood little chance against these hardened horse warriors of the Tibetan Plateau. An exchange of taunts between Gar's son and a Chinese general about the quality of their armies summarizes this dynamic well. After the Chinese general flaunted his superior numbers and demanded surrender, Gar's son replied, There is no disputing the matter of numbers, but many small birds are the food of a single hawk, and many small fish are the food of a single otter. A pine tree can be growing for a hundred years, but a single axe is its enemy. Although a river runs ceaselessly, it can be crossed in a moment by a boat only six feet long. Although barley and rice grow over the whole plain, it is all crushed by a single mill. Although the sky is filled with stars and the light of the sun, they are nothing. Gar Songsen's reign as regent had brought the Tibetan Empire to even greater power and had finally cut off Tang China from their western Silk Road holdings. The famously contemptuous Tang Chinese sources have this to say about Gar's rule. Although he was illiterate, Gar Songsen was naturally wise, resolute, strict, and honorable. A brave warrior and a skillful general, making him a most successful regent. And with that as his legacy, Gar Songsen died in 667 AD. Now being old enough to rule, Mansong Mansen, Songsen Gampo's grandson and the second Senpo of the Tibetan Empire, took control in 670 AD, with the major Silk Road state of Khotan being conquered under his rule. The conquest of Khotan would cause long-term conflicts with Tang China, who could not accept the loss of their Silk Road ally. Great powers met at the Battle of Daifei Chuchan, which was a crushing victory for the Tibetan Empire.
This victory allowed for the Tibetan Empire to take control of the entire Tamir Basin region just north of the Tibetan Plateau, and the Chinese would not regain these lands for several decades. Mansong Mansan also married a noblewoman, Trimalo, a woman who would happen to be of great importance in the Tibetan Empire's history. With the majority of his reign spent administering his large empire and new conquests, the second Senpo of the Tibetan Empire died in 677 AD. His son Tridu would then take the throne and become the third Senpo of the Tibetan Empire. The power of this young Senpo was offset to an extent by his mother Trimalo and the influence of a powerful clan known as the Gar. The young Senpo would be occupied with rebellions for most of his reign, first having to subdue a rebellion of the king of Shangsheng in West Tibet. It is notable that within his reign in 692 AD, the Chinese were able to regain their important Silk Road holdings in the Tamir Basin, as the Tibetan Empire could simply not afford the manpower to hold down and occupy the region. In 698 AD, Tridu Songsen, tired of the Gar clan's meddling within the internal affairs of his empire, devised a plan to get rid of them. He reportedly invited the entire clan, which is estimated to be around 2,000 people in total, to a grand hunting party. However, unfortunately for the Gar, this was no party at all. Hidden on the hunting trail was the Tibetan Empire's army. The Gar were massacred and any survivors of the clan fled to China, effectively ending their influence within the empire. With the troublesome Gar clan no longer meddling within the empire's internal affairs, the Simpo was left to campaign in the northeast, leaving the administration of the empire in his mother Trimalo's hands. In 702 AD, Tang China under Empress Wu Zaitan and the Tibetan Empire came to peace terms. These peace terms with their regional rival allowed for Tridu Songsen to continue his campaign in the northeast where he conquered several small kingdoms on the Yangtze's and Yellow Rivers, where he ultimately then died, likely from disease, while on campaign against the small kingdom of Maiwa in 704 AD. With Tridu's death, this now left his one-year-old infant son Tried Suksan as heir to the Tibetan Empire and with the title of the Fourth Simpo. However, still being an infant, this left his grandmother Trimalo to rule as regent until he came of age. This saw Tried's older brother, La Balpo, who was likely passed over for succession due to being deemed to be unfit to rule, attempt to seize the throne for himself. However, it seems that he failed in this attempt and was exiled. In 710 AD, Trimalo arranged a marriage to a Chinese princess, Zheng Cheng, for her seven-year-old grandson. The marriage to a Chinese princess brought high prestige and helped legitimize Tried's rule. And in 712 AD, Trimalo died and Tried Suksan took the throne at the age of nine. The empire was still likely administered by a capable council of administrators and advisors at this time. Also in this time period, from around 710 AD to 720 AD, the Umayyad Caliphate and the Turkish Khanate, fierce Turkish horse warriors from the Eurasian steppe, started to come in contact with the Tibetan Empire's borders in the west. The Tibetans allied with the Turkish, and at this time, Tried Tuxan was leading a campaign against the empire's old rivals of China throughout the last decade. Initially, the Tibetans and their Turkish allies were making progress and had the upper hand. However, losing several key battles left them in a threatened position. However, as fate would have it, a rebellion would break out in southern China, and the Tibetans scored a major victory in 730 AD. Soon after, the Tibetan Empire and its Turkish allies sued for peace with the Chinese on favorable terms. This allowed for the Tibetan Empire to assist their Turkish allies in the west and fight off the Muslim Arabs that were invading Transaxonia at the time. In 734 AD, Tried sealed an alliance with the Turkish Khan by sending a princess for him to marry. Around this time, the Muslim Caliphate, along with the Chinese, who quelled their southern rebellion, attacked and crushed the Turkish and made them sue for peace. The Chinese then quickly followed their victory over the Tibetan Empire's allies by attacking the empire directly. The Tibetan Empire suffered several key defeats and by 750 AD had lost most of their Central Asian holdings along the Silk Road. However, the following year, Tang China was defeated by the Caliphate and the Karluk Turks at the Battle of Talas. Chinese influence in the region as a result was erased and this allowed for Tried Suksan to increase the empire's influence there once again. The Tibetan Empire at this time had also started expanding its reach into northern India and conquered several petty kingdoms in the region. In 755 AD, returning from a successful campaign likely in northern India, Tried Suksan was betrayed and murdered by two of his ministers, Lang and Baal. Following a year interregnum where the empire had no emperor, Tried Suksan's son, Tri Song Didsen, took the throne in 756 AD at the age of 14 and became the fifth Senpo of the Tibetan Empire. It was under his rule that the empire would reach its greatest heights. 
Trisong started his rule by having his father's murderers and their families executed for treason and then turned his attention to reasserting Tibetan influence in Central Asia and the Silk Road regions west of Tibet, as taxing these regions trade was vital to the empire's economy. After reasserting control of the Silk Road regions, Trisong turned his attention to China, who had been weakened due to the Anxi Rebellion that had started in 751 AD and was still raging. The Tibetan Empire took this as an opportunity to start pressing into the territory of the Tang emperors. The Tibetan Empire's armies looted and annexed large portions of western China, with Tibetan soldiers reaching the capital of the Tang in 763 AD. They occupied the city for 15 days and installed a puppet emperor on the throne while Tang Emperor Daizong had fled the city. As Trisong Daitsen had no desire to govern all of China, he withdrew his army and focused on consolidating the power and restraining his new conquests in western China. Trisong would then spend the rest of his reign developing the Tibetan Empire internally, sponsoring Buddhism, and continuing the Tibetan conquests of the tribes of the empire's northern border in the Himalayan kingdoms of the south. It was at the end of his reign in 790 AD that he was declared Tibet's second Dharma king and the Tibetan Empire reached its largest territorial height, covering an area of 4,600,000 kilometers or 2 million square miles. However, this was not to last as in 794 AD the Chinese provinces he had gained in his youth had rebelled and reunited with Tang China shortly after. The rising power of the Uyghur Khanate was also causing problems on the Tibetan Empire's northern border at the time. Despite these challenges, the empire was still massive, powerful, and the dominant force in Central Asia when Trisong Daitsen abdicated the throne to his eldest son Mune Simpo in 797 AD. The sixth Simpo of the Tibetan Empire, however, the transfer of power did not go as his father had planned. Only after ruling for likely a year and a half, Mune was supposedly poisoned on the order of his own mother. After Mune's death, his brother Muntik Simpo was next in line for the throne. However, his brother had been exiled for murdering a senior minister, and this left his youngest son, Tridsongsen, known as Sadna Legs, as the ultimate successor in 804 AD, and he took the throne, becoming the seventh senpo of the Tibetan Empire. It was at this time that the Tibetan Empire was in a long protracted war on its western borders with the Abbasid Caliphate. It appears that the Tibetans, in fact, may have captured and pressed some of the Kalis men into their service and had the upper hand. The Tibetans were in control as far as Kabul and had even laid siege to Samarkand, but withdrew after failing to capture the city. However, it seems like the Arabs were able to turn the tide and ultimately forced the Tibetan governor of Kabul to convert to Islam in 812 AD. The Caliphate then continued the attack, this time through the Kashmir region. However, the Tibetans were able to defeat them and stop the advance. Shortly after, in 815 AD, Sadna Legs in the 7th Simpo of the Tibetan Empire died. After Sadnalig's death, the throne then passed to his son, the 8th Simpo of the Tibetan Empire, Tritsu Daitsen, widely known as Ralpachan. At the same time, the Uyghur Khanate had crossed the Tibetan Empire's northeastern borders and had started raiding the countryside. The Tibetan Empire under Ralpachan would return the favor and attack the Uyghurs in 821 AD, and also took some successful raids into China, forcing the Chinese to accept a peace offer soon after. The Sino-Tibetan Treaty established peace for two decades. A bilingual account of this treaty was placed outside the Jokan Temple in Lhasa. Ralpachan was known as a master diplomat. The Tibetan sphere of influence and culture reached its height under his reign, stretching from Mongolia to Bengal, with Lhasa becoming an unlikely metropolis with many foreign diplomats and scholars. However, Ralpachan is most famous for being the last of the three Dharma kings that brought Buddhism to Tibet. He was a generous supporter of Buddhism and invited many craftsmen, scholars, and translators to his court from neighboring realms. Ralpachan took many initiatives to help spread Buddhism throughout the empire. He promoted the development of written Tibetan within the population, sponsored the translation of Buddhist religious works into Tibetan, and made Buddhism the empire's official state religion. It was at the height of the empire's Buddhist enlightenment that in 838 AD, Ralpachan was murdered by two of his ministers that were reportedly supporters of the older religion of Bon and despised the spread of Buddhism throughout the empire. The ministers then placed Ralpachan's anti-Buddhist brother, Langadharma, on the throne, where he would become the ninth and last simpo of the Tibetan Empire. The reign of Langadharma was plagued by internal and external strife from the start. 
The Uyghur Khanate collapsed in 840 AD under pressure from the Kurds and other nomadic groups. This created a refugee crisis which saw thousands of displaced peoples cross the empire's northern borders, causing unrest and conflict within the region. At the same time, due to his brother's patronization of Tibetan Buddhism, a large part of the population were upset that Langadharma had reversed his brother's stance that Buddhism was the Tibetan Empire's official state religion. In 842 AD, it came to a boiling point, with Langadharma being assassinated, allegedly by a Buddhist monk. The news of Langadharma's death sent a shockwave throughout the empire, as without a clear successor, Vicious civil war started over the imperial throne between his sons, while many local chieftains and warlords and rebellions rose up and took this opportunity to carve up a piece of the empire for themselves. This period would be known as the Era of Fragmentation and would be the end of the Tibetan Empire, and it would never return. The territory of the former empire would eventually give rise to several powerful kingdoms. However, they would never rise to the cultural or an expansionist heights of the former empire and would eventually become vassal states of the Mongol Khans within the coming centuries.